look through our map, what we're going to look at is several things. There's uh, Africa over here with Lower Egypt. So what I'm going to do right now is draw this, and then if some of you want to write notes about this, I would advise that while I draw, you draw it together with me on your paper, okay? These are the most important civilizations during early Bible history. There's Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt during that time. As it goes through here, the Sinai Peninsula goes upward. And then over here is your Turkey. During that time, it was called Anatolia, supposedly. Over here is supposed to be Phoenicia. Then over here is the Syrian desert. Over in this region, we will have the Red Sea. So let's see. Let's see how clear this thing is. Okay, that's not bad. All right. So over here would be the Red Sea. Now, the most important river in Egypt is over here, their Nile River. It, was, it is practically their god, so to speak, this river. It was very important during that time. Then we covered some of, some of the other areas here, the Persian Gulf. Out of this Persian Gulf is where we start our history. Now, you notice how Satan, he tries to go, uh, start his history at a different direction, as we already knew before. The different direction that he would try to do is that he would focus on Egypt. We discussed that earlier before, too. But we're focusing on the Garden of Eden. That's where everything begins. That's where life begins. As a matter of fact, you might want to write this down in your notes that Satan, he tried to attack the beginning of our civilization in history with Egypt, that today it is standard teaching among evolutionists that where life began was in Africa because of Lucy, one of their oldest hominid fossils. So you notice how Satan always tries to start at the African region here, the Egyptian region. You got to realize that's where our corrupt Bibles came from. The Alexandrian manuscripts, where a majority of false Bibles came out. All right, so in this direction here, as you go further east, would be Media, which is Persia. And then further down, then it would be the Orient there. Over here would be Assyria. And then the famous sea over here, the largest, perhaps one of the largest bodies of water that the Bible would focus on, is the Mediterranean Sea. And then if you go further west, then that would be Europe. That's why Christianity was born, because the Gentiles were receptive here. The Gentiles were receptive that they received the Shemite or the Jewish gospel. So it was heading toward this direction. But then this, the devil corrupted it with Roman Catholicism, as you know in later history. And he already had his ancient corruption going on in Egypt. So there were two salient corruptions, which we'll cover later on in New Testament church history, is Egypt and Rome. And you've heard me in my previous discipleship videos as we went through world history that Egypt and Rome are the biggest enemies that you want to pay attention to.
They are the enemies of the Word of God throughout all of history. Throughout all of history. All right, so now that we got an idea of the region over here, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 1. And I told you about something interesting about natural resources, right? So let's look at Genesis chapter 2. We're going to look at the natural resources over here that was very interesting in the Garden of Eden. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 2. And here are several things that you want to know. The first thing is the gold at verse 12. Notice the Bible says, And the gold of that land is good. There is bdellium and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. Okay, now, this is pretty interesting over here, is that we know that throughout the Garden of Eden area, what, what kind of resource it was rich originally is gold. Notice that gold is the highest element in your Bible that is rich in natural resources. That would be first and the highest. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Notice how this element works. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now keep your hand at Genesis 2, remember. We're going to come back over here. Notice your heavenly rewards. The highest element is gold. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. At the judgment seat of Christ, one day, you and I are going to receive gold, silver, and precious stones. And the sequence of that is interesting. It goes uh, from best to worst elements. It goes gold, silver, precious stones, and then wood, hay, stubble. You'll notice that the sequence of burning goes from low to high. Stubble is the highest. That's why the burning is so high there that you have no reward. Whereas gold, it would go much, much less. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 Look at verse 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Okay, let's go to Ezekiel 28, please. Ezekiel chapter 28. Now, let's see something interesting here. Ezekiel chapter 28. Remember Satan? He used to have his own Eden back then. Remember that? Look at Ezekiel chapter 28. Now, Satan, as we all know, him and his fallen angels, and then his class of creatures, which could be the dinosaurs and dragons of that time, Lucifer, during that time, he was... He was wandering in Eden. Now remember, I don't know if I pointed this out before, but remember when we looked at Genesis chapter 2, it shows that Eden as if it was in existence before he put the garden there. The Bible says in Genesis 2, he planted a garden at this direction in Eden. So notice right there that Eden was already there before God put the garden of Eden over there. So let's look at Ezekiel chapter 28. Notice what Satan was decked in in Eden. Verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Look at this. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, diamond, barrel, ox, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and gold. Now notice it puts gold as last. It shows right here how important that element is. Gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. When he was created, these elements, these precious minerals, were a part of Lucifer's bar body, and you'll notice that he was from Eden. So, if we go back to Genesis chapter 2, look at this. Notice some of the elements at verse 12 matches with Ezekiel 28. Verse 12, and the gold of that land is good. Yeah, like Ezekiel 28, where Lucifer was at, gold was really rich over there. There is bdellium and the onyx stone. You'll notice that these elements 
over some of these elements were mentioned in Ezekiel 20, 28. Now, if Lucifer was decked in such rich minerals that time, and the gold he was shining, and that was from where? It was from Eden? Then, think about this. Could Adam and Eve, when they were created, they were created with the same element as that shining golden glow as well? Which is why sometimes when you look at movies, the Greek gods, they will have this, what, golden shine around them. That's why John mentioned at Revelation chapter 1 when he saw God, his feet was like what? Shining as if it was like fine brass. See, it was giving that kind of golden, quote unquote, glow, so to speak. Well, where, how was Adam created? From the dust of the ground. Look at that. Adam's location is in Eden, but he was born from what? That ground. See? So it is very, very likely that Adam and Eve, they were created with that golden glow from that ground. Look at Genesis chapter 2 and look at verse 6. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So notice right here that Adam, he was created from what? That ground. So Adam and Eve, all of us were created with that golden glow, so to speak. That's why no wonder Satan hated mankind. Why? Because God is focusing on mankind now, no longer on the devil, right? So because it's no longer the devil here, so Satan, he gets jealous, he gets upset. And because he gets upset at man and woman, that's why he wants them. He wants to kill all of us. That would be his final goal. Why? Because God drowned out Satan and eliminated, killed his kingdom with that universal flood. All right. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Notice right here that Adam and Eve, because of their sin, their nature of sin, this golden glow is lost. When sin comes in, it just prevents you from looking inside this box and the golden glow. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at verse 40. There are also what? Celestial bodies and what? Bodies terrestrial. Did you see that right there? So notice over here that there is such a thing as a heavenly type of body. A golden glow type of body because keep reading. Verse 41, there is one glory of the sun. See, glowing. And another glory of the moon. And another glory of the stars. For one star differed from another star in glory. Verse 44, it is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. See that? So notice right here, uh, this natural body that was first is speaking of who? Adam at verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Verse 47, the first man is of the earth earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the what? Earthy, we shall also bear the image of the what? Heavenly. So notice right over here, Adam in 1 Corinthians 15, when he fell in his sinful state, it was known as what? Natural body. It was also known as earthy. A 
if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the term natural man is referring to what? A sinful body, a sinner. 1 Corinthians 15 is focusing on Adam's body not in his sinless state. It was focusing on his body in his sinful state. So notice that Adam's body, when he fell into sin, this is the kind of body he had. But if he was sinless, like Jesus Christ, like all of us will become, and the book of Isaiah mentioned that when God restores the kingdom on earth, it's going to be like what? The Garden of Eden. It's going to be like back then. So then everything's going to be in a sinless state. If it's going to be at the sinless state, what will it be like? It would be like this golden glow at 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 41 shows that kind of glow with the spiritual body, right? It shows a sinless body. So notice right here, 1 Corinthians 15 shows the differences with the sinful state of the body versus the sinless state. The sinless state will be a glow, so to speak, a glowing body. And that's what Adam had when we look at Genesis chapter 2. All righty, let's go back. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 2. Now, Adam, his name means mud, dirt, or earth, actually, which is pretty interesting. But it's not like how we're thinking about as a normal type of dirt. Because remember, uh, what we see right here is God's created dirt at Genesis 2-7. And not only that, we see the gold of that land was very good at verses 11 through 12. And Ezekiel 28 pointed out that Lucifer, when he used to live in Eden, he was decked with what? Gold and all these precious instruments. So the Garden of Eden, you got to realize that time was like a glow. It was a land glowing. Pember mentioned that the Garden of Eden, so remember G.H. Pember, Earth's Earliest Ages, his book? So I mentioned that before. I'm not going to document that right now. So Pember, he believed that the Garden of Eden would have been decked with all these golden minerals throughout everywhere, the trees, the plant, the dirt, and everything. Now me, I don't carry it that far, but I'll tell you something interesting. Heaven is pretty close to that. Streets of pure gold. It has trees, rivers of life. So notice that heaven is pretty close to that. So Pember may be closer to the truth than you think. So it may not be just like a natural type of earth that we see today. It's more beautiful than that. Okay. So we see that sort of natural resource. That's why, think about it, today what happens to gold, that the economy standards of gold, it's so low rated now. It went downhill. The economy. There are some conspiracies that talk about that at Fort Knox that the gold over there is pretty much fake or they're lying. Not only that, there are some conspiracies that talk about that during that time when the government wants to uh, weaken the people and the nations at that time, that you have to attack this standard over here. So then the people, what do we get? Now we get pretty much like paper. I mean, look, you got to realize this is that the dollar bills that you have in your hand is worthless. It is worthless. And now that we're switching to computer in this invisible world, it's getting worse. So then the substance, we're losing it. Why? Because Satan wants to take away that substance from you. He wants to grab every single substance from you and deck himself with gold. That's why his beings, the elites, they're hoarding all the gold. The Vatican is worth billions, and then they deck themselves in gold. The certain elites, the bankers, etc., what? They're hiding and hoarding up all this money. So then the gold is taken for the elites. And James chapter 5 told you at the tribulation that those elites, those rich people, God's going to judge their gold. Their gold's going to be cankered, rot, rot, rotted away. And then God's people are the ones starving to death at the tribulation. 
And everyone is going by an inv invisible economic resource, a mark. Come on. A chip or a piece of ink? See, Satan t grabbed everything from mankind. He wants to hoard all the gold, all the economy, all the money for himself. All right, so that makes a lot of sense as you look at later on in history, right? It makes a lot more sense now what's going on. I mean, if you look at the banks, the conspiracies concerning the banks, it gets pretty disturbing over there. And then that's why a lot of people uh, get, get on to the Jewish bankers, but you also have to look that there's a lot of Catholic bankers as well. If you look at the Knights of Malta, supposedly total up all the banks of the Knights of Malta, it totals more than the Rothschilds, which is pretty interesting. So, and the Knights of Malta, they're considered a lower tire compared to the Jesuits. So the Catholic Church is really powerful. See, Satan's enemy always was Rome and Egypt. Those were his people that were enemies of God's people. Enemies of God's people. Egyptians have some interesting thing about gold as well. About gold and blue colored skin, etc. So it gets really interesting. But what did God, how did God judge Egypt? Egypt lost its gold and its power, gave it to who? The Jews. See, Satan was hoarding it all to himself in Egypt, but God's like, no, give it back to my people. But Satan tries to attack the Jews now and says, I want you to use that gold to build me a golden calf. And then you look at 3,000, uh, you look at a couple thousand years later, God's chosen people, the Jews, now join Satan's camp with the Jewish bankers and some of the Jewish elites getting the gold. And then Satan's own enemies with the, through Roman power hoards all that gold. See how Satan's doing this? You see how our world history is important? It explains a lot of things about later on today. All right, that's one natural resource. Let's look at the second natural resource here. Verse 6. Okay, now how did God keep all of vegetation and life going, right? That's our question. Look at verse 5. Verse 5. <clears throat> and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. During that time, people did not have to work the ground to create uh, vegetation and food. Why? Verse 6, But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Look at that. So in this Garden of Eden, it was rich in minerals, and it was rich in water as well. Now remember, there was this water coming from the ground, right? Adam was created not just from the gold of the ground, but from what? From the water of that ground. I mean, that's what the verse says at verse 6. The water came from what? There went, went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So Adam was created with that gold as well with water, which is very interesting as you hear what Satan will have through conspiracies about blue-blooded aliens. Now look at 1 John 5. Go to 1 John 5. Not only that, if you go to the Rosicrucian Museum, which is pretty interesting over here, they have these pictures of Egyptians where they would deck them as blue-colored, so to speak, as the gods or the people, which is pretty interesting. If you go to the, the Aztec history, etc., they color themselves in blue. The Hollywood movie, I think they, I forgot the name of the movie. It was by Gibson. What? Apocalypto. Oh, yeah, Apocalypto. How they would offer the sacrifice to the gods was that they would color these people's body in what? Blue. Why? Because water was also connected to that heavenly celestial godhood, quote-unquote, state as well. Not just the gold, but water as well. Hence, blue-blooded aliens, so to speak. Look at 1 John chapter 5. We're all born out of this. Verse 6, 1 John 5, 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, now look what it says about Jesus Christ when he's born. When Jesus Christ is born, it says, not by what? 
water only. Why would it say that? And then later on it says, but by water and blood. This is interesting. It's showing right here about the incarnation of Jesus when he transforms into a human, correct? Because it's emphasizing his importance of transforming to a human, that's why it's saying at verse 6, even Jesus Christ, not by water only. Why? Because it's emphasizing his human state. What makes him a human state? Keep reading, but by water and what? Blood. So it shows right here then that the humanity state would be two elements. It's water and blood. But with Jesus Christ is not by water only. Why? Because he became human. So it's water and blood. Translation, meaning not just Jesus Christ where he consists of water, but when he transformed into human, he took on blood as well. That means in the heavenly state, see, there is no blood. If there's no blood, that leaves only what? Water. Humans are born with water and blood. That's how life is formed and created. But the heavenly state has no blood. That leaves only with them with a the water circulata circulatory system. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 shows you that glowing state, right? But it also tells you there's no blood in that state. No blood. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. The heavenly state also consists of no blood. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 49. Verse 49. Now you notice that how much hist a wealth of history before we even jump to chapter 3. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly, right? Now this heavenly body consists, look at this, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and what? Blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. No blood. That leaves a water circulatory system in your heavenly state. So that makes sense that Satan and his beings consist of water circulatory system. Heavenly states would consist of water circulatory system. Adam and Eve had a water circulatory system as well. See that? That's crazy. Look at that. So then you're saying, Pastor, once they took on the human state, see that? That sinful human state, that's when they got the blood, right? Yeah, you're using your head now. You're using your head. All right. So we'll come to that a little bit later on. That's why do you think, why do you think blood is important to God for salvation? Concerning about the sinful human body, why is blood important? Why do you think that the, uh, the, one of the uh, first actions of sin, besides disobedience, that Satan wanted was what? Blood spilled on the ground through Cain murdering Abel. Why do you think, Cain, uh, why do you think Satan loves human sacrifices? Blood is a corruption. And God sees that as a violation. He wants sinless, innocent blood. That's why he wanted a lamb without spot. That's why Jesus Christ fulfilled that task. Blood's important to God. All right. Let's go back. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 2. So the natural resource of that ground is also water. So... The creationists talk about this uh, water canopy theory. This water canop canopy theory, supposedly, what they do is when God created the firmament at the second day of creation, they confuse that as the water canopy theory. No, -uh, that's not true. We already saw the second day of God's creation. The firmament was when he was creating that division of the waters and those division of the waters is not some kind of water canopy theory. The division of the waters, as we saw last time, was the waters below were the seas. The waters above, which is also called sea, is sea of what? Glass at the end of the universe over there. So the creationists get that wrong. The water canopy, if you want to get anywhere close to that, would be Genesis chapter 2, verse 6. 
See, that's much, much later. Not only that, the water canopy theory requires this water state to be above the earth. Over here, it's what? From the ground at verse 6. Now, if Bible believers are going to believe some type of water canopy theory, we're going to deny the second day of creation, the firmament, as the water canopy theory. If we want to believe in it, we're going to go for Genesis chapter 2, verse 6. So Bible believers will either dismiss the canopy theory or they'll believe it according to Genesis chapter 2, verse 6. What's very interesting is that because of this watery state from the ground, this would make a lot of sense why there were discoveries where scientists discovered about animals in abnormal large sizes. They found dragonflies as like, uh, like probably like 12 feet long or something, or 10 feet long. It's like huge. If I'm, get, if I'm exaggerating, at least a couple feet long. They were really, really big. The reason why is because of that watery state. Not only that, what's also interesting is that because of our environment today, that's why years are shortened out of our lives. But then if you want to look at more healthy states, the more healthy state was during the time of Genesis where these people were able to live a thousand years long. How were they able to live that long? Because of that watery state from the ground. It prolonged their years, their life. Interesting, Japan is like all the way over there, and a lot of people live longer years as well, which is kind of interesting, which I don't know if it has anything to do with uh, a more being surrounded by a body of water or what, but I will tell you this much. Genesis chapter 2, verse 6, would explain a lot of the things why you can find humongous sorts of plant and also abnormal sizes of insects. Why? Because of that water from the ground. And then it also explains why human life was much longer that time. As we read Noah's flood, you're, what you're going to find out, what's very interesting, is that the long length of years gets shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. Especially when we come to um, the New Testament time period, like people can't live, uh, can't live up to 200 years. During Moses' time, they lived up to close to 150, somewhere around there. But you can tell the gap was shortening, shortening. Why? The environment was deteriorating because of that watery state being lost. So that's another natural resource, which is pretty interesting. All right. Now, a third natural resource, which is pretty interesting. Now, isn't this interesting already? Yeah, we're already learning a lot over here. Yeah. So it makes a lot of sense why Satan uh, and certain conspiracies that you look up today and mythology, why there's blue blood and aliens with blue blood and then sacrifices that would deck themselves as if they were blue blood and gods as if they would be blue in color and not just gold. But another resource which is pretty interesting is oil. Where do we get our oil from? Now, oil would come... now. There are a good number of creationists and perhaps even Bible believers that would explain that where we get our oil from is because of all of human life that was lost at Noah's flood. So because of all that human life lost at Noah's flood, when the humans were decomposing on that ground underneath, it became what? It became a rich source where you can eventually have and receive oil eventually, which is pretty interesting. Some of you don't know this, but inside your human body, it could be used as a rich source for fire, actually, which is pretty interesting. Human fat is something else. Human fat is something else. So that's what a lot of creationists and Bible believers uh, would teach. But there's also another theory. Another theory could be that it's all natural. During the time of the Garden of Eden, not only was it rich in gold and in water, it could be also rich in oil. There are some scientists who give this theory, which is interesting. Now, what I'm going to read to you is by Widowson, Frederick Widowson. Remember that book that I recommended? I told you you didn't have to buy, but I highly recommended it because a lot of what I'm going to teach is going to uh, show his quotes. He mentions this. Existing reservoirs of oil, where then did it come from? 
Another interesting fact is that every oil field throughout the world has outgassing helium. Helium is so often present in oil fields that helium detectors are used as oil prospecting tools. Helium is an inert gas known to be a fundamental product of the radiological decay or uranium and thorium identified in quantity at great depths below the surface of the earth, 200 and more miles below. It is not found in meaningful quantities in areas that are not producing methane, oil, or natural gas. It is not a member of the dozen or so common elements associated with life. Here's something else that's interesting. He mentions here, it is found throughout the solar system as a solar system, solar system. It is found throughout the solar system as a thoroughly inorganic product. That's on page 14. Now he gives a quotation here by Dr. Kenny from with the article title, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, U.S. That's August 2002. It's from that work. And from that work, the partial title is The Genesis of Hydrocarbons and the Origin of Petroleum. You know what this scientist concluded? With three Russian co-authors. The hydrogen carbon system does not spontaneously evolve hydrocarbons at pressures less than 30 kbar, even in the most favorable environment. The HC system evolves hydrocarbons under pressures found, found, found in the mantle of the earth and at temperatures consistent with that environment. He was quoted as saying, Compe quote, unquote, competent physicists, chemists, chemical engineers, and men knowledgeable of thermodynamics have known that natural, natural petroleum does not evolve from biological materials since the last quarter of the 19th century. Now that's pretty interesting. That's pretty interesting over there. So it may be possible <clears throat> that some of the elements that would make up oil that it could be found within naturally from the earth and these could be leftovers from the Garden of Eden. But he mentions that some of the elements where we get our petroleum and oil can be found throughout our solar system. Now you know what? Let me show you a third theory then. Alright? The third theory then could be this. If this is found throughout uh, let's do this. Throughout our solar system somewhere out there out there in the universe somewhere. Throughout our solar system, if the oil could be found over here, it would it probably explain the color of outer space as dark and black, and oil as dark and black. But another thing is that if remnants of oil and petroleum, or the elements that make up for it, used to be here on the Earth, and also up there in outer space, think about this. Creationists talk about that where we get our petroleum and oil is from the decayed or the dead bodies of the people who died at Noah's flood. What about a universal flood that drowned out Satan's class of creatures and some of the fallen angels that were on earth and throughout the universe. Wow. That would be very, very interesting. So there's your third theory. And Satan, he does have an infatuation with oil as well. Why? Look at Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Now, think about it. The Muslim world They're trying to rob the other nations with their rich resource that they're depending upon, and that's oil. Not only that, you'll notice that all the world, they're bending their knee because of what? Because of oil. Oil is that important to the world. The elite system, that's why they want to keep 
in charge of those big gas companies and the banks want to keep careful eye on those things. Why? The elites, because oil is rich where you can get all the world to bend the knee. So it's not just gold that Satan wants to hoard. It, water was very interesting concerning about satanic creatures and the heavenly creatures, but also oil as well. Look at Revelation 6. This will happen at the tribulation. In the tribulation, famine will take away everything except this, Revelation 6.6. 6. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the what? Oil and the wine. All right, go back to Genesis 2. Now, we're like stuck at Genesis 2. <laughs> Isn't that really interesting? You've seen enough of the, over here at Genesis. All right, now, this is where Satan starts attacking. What Satan starts attacking, we will start off, let's see over here, at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. This passage will be quoted by liberal universities if they want to make a commentary on the Bible. If they'll ever make a commentary on the Bible, this story will always be mentioned. Why? Because this is the first mention of the devil, and that shows those higher education systems are full of the devil themselves. Why? Because this is the key. What higher education wants to teach is the wealth of knowledge and what's wrong with eating a fruit off a tree. So this creature could be a positive creature, the serpent. The New Age teaching as well, ye shall be as gods and higher knowledge, attaining more knowledge. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1, Satan attacks again. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God had said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now, you'll notice right here, verses 1 through 6 is rich. It is extremely rich. I'm going to try to cover all of them, and then uh, I don't think I'll be able to cover more than that tonight. So I'll just cover this part. Okay. This is extremely rich because it's going to lay the foundations of corruption in our world history, okay? Let's first start off with Genesis chapter 3. And then notice verse 1, the first one. The first thing you'll see that is satanic. So let's look at every satanic reference here, shall we? What's satanic? Signs of satanic things that you will see today that is fully alive and well. Questioning the word of God. Did God really say that? Okay, that's why modern Bibles are satanic. Why? They question, does the Bible really say that? So let's give a better translation here because we found newer manuscripts of what God's word really says. That's a satanic sign you want to watch out for. That's a sign of higher education schools. Uh, the Bible was written by a bunch of men. Oh, how do you know that the Bible is really true? I go by science rather than the Bible. See, it's attacking the authority of the Word of God. That is the birth of every satanic sin. Before we cover all the other sins at verse 6, you're going to notice the progress. It starts with questioning the final authority, yep. the Word of God, and that is absolutely essential. I want every one of you and people online to get nailed in your head. Be, when you come into temptation and to sin and to any dark thing, it all begins somewhere. It begins, guarantee, when you attack the final authority, the Word of God. 
When you doubt that book is perfect in your hands. That's why the King James only issue is very important. That's why this Mandela effect conspiracy is of the devil as well. Tries to cast doubt on the word of God. All right. Let's look at verse 2 through 3. What happens? Mankind yields. The woman yields to the temptation because did God really say that? And Eve, how she responds is that she corrects the word of God. So a satanic sign is when they start questioning the word of God and make you react by correcting God by correcting the Bible. You ever seen these pastors, these creationists? Yeah, the, even these creationists. And these so-called Christian apologists trying to defend their faith. What, when the world attacks our faith, attacks God, how do they react? They react by correcting what the Bible says. They react by correcting right doctrine. And they try to help out God so that they can meet up with human rationalism and be on a par on their level so that Christians look, can look intelligent and educated. That is wickedness sent from hell. Yeah. If you don't react by correcting the Bible. Notice that God never said that at verse 2 through 3. You'll notice that if you compare that with chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 16, and 17, verses 16 through 17, that Eve, what did she do? Eve, she was subtracting from the Word of God, adding to the Word of God, and even changing the Word of God, just like modern versions are doing. So notice that it says, neither shall he touch it at verse 3, right? So that's added. Notice that freely is not mentioned over here, right? At verses 2 through 3. So she subtracted from the word of God. And then you'll notice that she also changed the word of God. Okay, uh, we're going to look at verse 4 now. Now verse 4, a satanic sign is lying. But lying consists of truth as well. Lie with truth. For example... It is very true that when you uh, look at genetics, that it can, that there is a way for these certain genes for to have random mutations. Random mutations is possible, and you can even change and surpass a certain genetic code when you give it enough time. It is very possible. I've seen it happen. We've done the experiments. Is that true or lie? It's actually true. So there are a few things that they're coming out now that creationists have been baffled with, is that they claim that there's this certain parts of genes or bacteria and et cetera where it can change pretty much a genetic code. Now, creationists and evolutionists, they're debating back and forth that it didn't technically change the genetic code, et cetera. But who cares? Let's forget that. The point is, is that they're going to pull up some evidence through genetics or through the geological column, or through carbon-14 dating, or radiometric dating, that they're going to point you out scientific statements that are true. But it's a lie. You might say, why is it a lie? They're not going to show you that other part, like, okay, so it may be true that you can have all these elements where through a matter of time and through randomness that it can connect and evolve, but for crying out loud, they don't tell you what happens 100 years later after that. You know what happens 100 years later after that? It's not going to keep evolving. It's going to break apart again. You can't overthrow second law thermodynamics. They don't tell you that. They don't tell you that. I've seen evolution happen. Here's the second thing that they overlooked. Yeah, you know why evolution happened, so to speak, that change happened? Because there was an intelligent designer behind it who put all these elements together and made sure that the conditions were right so that those elements can come together and then evolve. Intelligent design, thank you. They don't tell you that. See, liars, liars, pants on fire. Yep. A lot of these people don't know that. So if people claim that they saw it change through random mutation, spontaneous generation, always argue this, intelligent design. They put those things in the lab. And they spent millions of dollars on it, too. That shows how hard they had to put intelligent work to design all of that. 
How about that, huh? Not only that, they didn't let it go on for a hundred years. You let it go for a hundred years, a million years after that? Watch second law of thermodynamics come into play. Boom. Especially billions of years. That's even worse. That weakens evolution. All right? Onliners. You watch a lot of stuff online. And oh, it's true, there's documentation. Oh, it's true, they point out that right there. But guess what? They're not showing you the lie behind it. It's a half-truth. Watch out for that. That's a satanic sign. All right. Um, I got to... I got to end it here. Okay, so I'm not going to cover the next satanic signs. So I'll cover the remaining satanic signs uh, next week. I, gotta, I, I passed the time. I apologize. Thank you so much for listening. But already we've seen too much information in our history from Chapter 2 and partially at Chapter 3. Wait till we continue on with world history, huh? It's going to be mind-blowing. There's going to be way much information at the beginning. When we get on to the latter parts of history, it's going to go much faster. The reason why it's taking such a long time at the beginning is because that's where foundations are laid for everything else in history. And I'm going to show you how that all connects. It's going to be intensely interesting. All right, let's uh, close the discipleship. God, my Father, I pray tonight's teachings were a blessing to the hearers, opened our eyes more to the truth of your scripture, the importance of your word, and that we'll be aware of the devil's devices. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that He can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what He did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, Pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through His blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do.
and go to our resources site www.bbcenglish.org and click on the resources link over there and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.